on that note, pun intended. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed. second I am statement Jesus made which is I am the light of the world and I was thinking about that all through last week after our study and uh, I don't know why this didn't come to me beforehand but light of the world you step down into darkness open my eyes This heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. Oh, 
Here I am to worship. Here I am. 
this, uh, somebody was teaching Bible teaching. And it was a very quiet moment. I don't remember what they were teaching about, but it was a very quiet moment. And the speaker said these words. He said, just the name of Jesus is a prayer. Just the name of Jesus is a prayer. When you say to the Father, Jesus, Jesus, you're speaking the words God likes best. Just the name of Jesus is a prayer. I love that. So, why the world? Now the light of the world is going to introduce himself as the door. We're in John 10, chapter 10. I am really pumped about the light because I saw something I have never, ever seen before. Which is not unusual for me, but this is another one. So in John 10, it really gave me life this week. I hope it will give you life as well. <clears throat> I'm just going to read chapter 10. Um, at least as far as verse 29. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Verse 6, Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If any man enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. We're familiar with John 10, 10. The thief comes not except to kill, to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have that life more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The shepherd gives, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he who is a hireling and not the shepherd the one who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling. He does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. They also I must bring. And they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life. That I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay down, lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. This command I received from the Father. The command you received from the Father. I'm reminded of John 14. 
31, but that the world may know that I love the Father as the Father commands, so I do. You want to know why Jesus came into the world? He came into the world because the Father commanded it. You can't separate Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. They are of the same essence. Many heresies try to teach that Jesus is one, the Father is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. No, Jesus will make it very clear by the end of this chapter that he and the Father are one. They're the same spirit. They're the same essence. That's, that's very important. Okay. Now, let's go back to the very first verse. I want you to see this. Most assuredly, I say to you, verse, verse 1, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Here's what I saw this week. This conversation began in chapter 8. I'm always talking about context, right? The context of what Jesus has just said started in chapter 8 when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And the Pharisees clearly knew that only God could make that kind of claim. As we hear it in our language and in our culture, that doesn't mean that to us. But to the Jews, first of all, they were familiar with the I am name of God, which Jesus used when he said, I am the self-existent one, the uncaused cause, the eternal one, ruler above all, God Almighty, El Shaddai, all of those names are wrapped up in I am. And when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he's saying, you want to know what God looks like? Look in front of you because I'm standing here. <laughs> I'm him. Then the Jews said, you're saying you're God? Jesus says, yeah, I'm saying I'm God. And the Jews said, you must have a demon. To which Jesus replied, and you're the son of the devil. You're sons of the devil. This is the conversation that started in verse, in chapter 8, that is now still continuing right after the healing of the blind man. The same guys are hanging out. Same guys are hanging out. And Jesus is saying to them, Let's, let's look at the very last verse of chapter 9. Well, let me do uh, 40, 40 and 41. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But because you say we see, your sin remains. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the sheepfold. It's all one thought. That's why I say when you see a cut between chapters, remember that was done by men. <laughs> Don't let it break the chain of thought or the train of thought if indeed it connects. Jesus is still talking to the same guys. Why is he called? Who, who are these guys, first of all? They're Pharisees, right? That's who's been having this conflicted conversation with for the last three chapters two chapters they're Pharisees if somebody called you a son of the devil and somebody <coughs> called you a thief and a robber and a murderer wouldn't you have some certain feelings toward them then why do we blame the Pharisees for wanting to kill Jesus? They don't want to lie on the head of the That's true. That's true. But he had publicly humiliated them, is what I'm trying to get you to see here. That's why they wanted to take it says they wanted to take up stones. 
right? They don't want to take up stones, man, because he publicly humiliated. How would you like to be in public and your job is to argue and every time you open your mouth, the same guy shows up and shuts you down? That's what's happening to the Pharisees. Every time they open, the law says this woman should be stoned. What do you think, Jesus? Humiliates them publicly. You must have a demon. Well, I got one better than that, boys. You're sons of the devil himself. Publicly humiliated them. Now, why does I found I saw this this week too. Why does he call them thieves and robbers? If you go back to John two, in John's gospel, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he clears the temple. Yeah. He runs out the thieves and the robbers, right? He runs the extortionists. I know churches that use this to keep people from selling CDs. Back when we used to sell CDs, keep people from selling anything in the church. That's not what this scripture is about. This scripture is about people. It's about leadership extorting God's people. That's what was happening. We got the Pharisee mafia right here. That's what we got. And Jesus is getting in real trouble because right in the second chapter of John, he messes with their pocketbook. I want you to understand the context. He's messing with their money. It's one thing to say something about them publicly. It's one thing to humiliate them publicly, but it's another thing to get in their bank account. So, he says, anybody that comes up any other way, comes up to where? You ever ask yourself that question? Where's Jesus talking about coming up to? Anyone who comes up by any other way is a thief and a robber. Coming up to where? Entering heaven. Or that, about right before, before death, basically. Okay. Uh, try to gain salvation through anything other than faith. Gain salvation. Gain salvation. Anyone trying to join God's family any other way is a thief and a robber. Jesus is addressing, listen carefully, false religions. Have you ever wondered when you boil down most false religions in the world to their smallest essence, they all basically teach the golden rule. You get to nirvana by the golden rule. So treat others as you would be treated. Have you ever wondered why? I have. I think I have an answer. We studied the new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, God says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant and I will write my laws on men's hearts. He didn't say all would be saved, but he said I would write my law on their hearts. See, when you're born in this dispensation, if you want to use that word, I try to be careful with it, but in this dispensation, when you're born, you have the law of God written on your heart. Before I became a Christian, I knew when I was doing wrong, man. And I honestly don't believe anybody doesn't know that. I really don't. There might be a few people. Well, to ignore it and know it's two different things. I'm not saying you can't ignore it, but to, but if you get down to brass tacks, as my daddy used to say, in serious conversation, they will admit to you they're doing wrong. But that's not the issue. Lots of people do wrong. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, you're self-righteous. The most scathing words Jesus ever had for anyone was not to sinners. It was to the self-righteous. A door opens, a door closes, right? This door is closed to all self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. It only opens to those who, who will sue for mercy. The Pharisees had no idea how badly they needed mercy. Let me give you an example of that. 
that you may not believe it. We go back. Remember the story um, in Luke ten. I'm going to flip over there. In Luke ten, it's the story of the prayers of two people. One is a Pharisee, the self righteous one, and the other is a publican. He's a tax collector. You can't get any lower in that society, the Jew society, than a tax collector. He's a scum of the scum of the scum. He works for the IRS, all right? The lowest on the total pole. They both come to the temple and they both pray. I said Luke 10, it's actually Luke, sorry, Luke 18. It's Luke 18, 10. I only know that because I just looked at Luke 10 and that ain't happened. All right. So verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. Watch carefully. I fast twice a week. If you think fasting makes you more spiritual, you might want to remember this carefully. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. You couldn't just put money in the plate back in those days. You had to cut off a portion. You had to separate a portion. Going to the temple would have been like going to the stockyard, man. <laughs> People are driving in stuff, bringing in birds, all, all kinds of stuff. A tenth of all they possess if they were a Pharisee, a good quote unquote Pharisee. Now the tax collector. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat on his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. The door is shut to the self-righteous. And Jesus wants to make it very clear that there's only one way. People like to like to say that uh, Oprah is one of those people. She loves to say that there are many ways to God. Mm. Since there are many ways and they all lead to the same place, they all lead to God. No, part of that's true. There are many paths, and all other paths do lead to the same place. It's called judgment and destruction. The door, remember in just a few verses, we're told by the Holy Spirit that the people didn't understand Jesus' allegory, right? So he says again, I am the door. No man comes to the Father but through me. Can you get any clearer? All right. The door is exclusive. There's only one. According to Jesus. There's only one. So, that door is shut to the self-righteous, but it's open to those who plead for mercy. Is it any wonder, remember the hymn, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father, there is no shadow of turning to thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Here's where I'm getting to. Great is thy, sing it with me, faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. That was taken right out of scripture. His mercies are new every morning. Yesterday's mercy won't get it for you. There's new mercy today. 
but only those who sue for mercy can get it. The self-righteous, if you're keeping a scorecard of how well you did yesterday and how well you've not done today, you can't have mercy. You can only get, here's the qualification for mercy. When you know, when you come to God and know that you have nothing but nothing to offer him, that's when you get mercy. And we human beings don't like that. Surely I have something I can offer. I always wanted to sit down with Chris Christopherson and talk about his second verse, Why Me, Lord? Y'all think of those words. I'll let you simmer on those. It's important what you sing. It's important what mood and feelings are not nearly as important as words when it comes to relating the truth. You see, I got nothing. I know exactly why Jesus died for me because I have nothing to offer him. I had nothing. I got nothing. I will have nothing. Jesus is all. It's like the little story we told about the, the thief. When he's asked why he come to the, came to the gate, remember that story? And at the end of all the questions, St. Peter's asking him all these questions, at the end of all the questions, he says, I don't know about all this stuff, but there's one thing I know. The man on the middle cross said I could come. When you see, if, if, if you see me go into heaven, you'll know there's only one reason Carrie got there. Because the man on the middle cross said I could come. When you go to the man on the middle cross with nothing, he gives you everything. That's called mercy. <coughs> mercy keeps you <coughs> from getting what you deserve. But mercy also turns the key of grace, which gives you everything you don't deserve. The Pharisees had no idea how deeply lost we are. Mankind. No idea. They would have been crying for mercy. But they didn't. So that door was closed to them. Okay. There are my time. Yeah. There are three scenes in this chapter. <clears throat> I don't pretend to be able to pull all this out but I, I would like you to think about this verses 1 through 5 give you the scene of mourning it's a morning time early morning time scene Bethlehem was known For a place that would keep sheep, multitudes of sheep, that would be used in sacrifice. Did you know that? The sacrifice came from Bethlehem. Bethlehem is known for having sheep for sacrifice. These folks would have been familiar with that picture. A shepherd, having brought his sheep in, in the evening, would have deposited his sheep in a, we call it a corral, all right? Somewhere where there's a gate, somewhere where there's a door, a barn, a corral, whatever. And overnight, those sheep would mix with other sheep because other sheep had been brought in as well. And they're all put in this one big place. In the morning, the next morning, the shepherd would come and the porter would open to him, knowing he was a shepherd, and the shepherd would call his sheep. And his sheep would begin to, I want to see this sometime, I like to see this now. The sheep began to separate, his sheep began to separate from the other sheep, and they move out and follow their shepherd. I just think that's so cool. But the porter only opens to the shepherd he knows. The porter recognizes the shepherd. And he allows the shepherd to call his sheep. The second scene is verses 7 through 10. 
It's daytime. It's when the shepherd has brought the sheep out through the door and they're going to find pasture and he leads them, he leads the sheep to good pasture. The third scene is an evening scene. Now, what's different about the evening? I gotta move my chair up. My son's forgetting me. What, uh, what's different about the evening scene? The evening scene, when the shepherd would be bringing his sheep out of the pasture to uh, to the fold, would be the time that predators lurk. So we got predators looking to do harm to the sheep. Jesus, the door, by the way, let me, let me just go back to the door for a second. I want you to get this. Romans 5, 2. The door provides access. The door provides access to peace with God, to favor with God, and the eternal family of God. If you come up any other way, <laughs> no, there is no other way to come up. Otherwise, you'll be a thief and a robber. Don't want to be a thief and a robber. Be like Jesus. Don't be like a thief and a robber. <laughs> okay? The, I said the door is exclusive. By the way, I'm going to get back to the evening scene in a minute. But I got ahead of myself. The door is the narrow way Jesus mentioned in the seventh chapter of Matthew. He said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. That's the thief and robber way. But narrow is the way, that's the door to the fold. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Jesus is about to say, as we, as we read a few minutes ago, he says, when I leave my sheep out, I give them life. Okay. So the narrow way is the only way to reality. It's the only way, it's the exclusive way to life, to real life. Now I'm looking at verse 11 here, back to John. Well, let me not get too far ahead because we need to remember that Jesus is talking to the self-righteous and in verse uh, 9 excuse me verse 8 all who came before me Jesus re is reiterating what he said about anyone that climbs up any other way in verse 9 he's reiterating that thought and saying all who came before me now I've had a lot of trouble with that verse over the years because I'm thinking of people who came before Jesus uh, Abraham came before Jesus David came before Jesus Jeremiah came before Jesus Isaiah righteous people people God considered righteous I'm not calling them righteous God called them righteous okay what Did you know that through all lots miss, he's called a righteous man in Hebrews? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. See, when God calls you righteous, nobody else can say different. <laughs> we can't say, but but God, we need to change this verse in Hebrews because Lot was a mess, man. He's psychosomatic. I don't know what he was, but he, he, won't, he won't write, okay? God says he was righteous. End of story. That's that's right. He's the only, his word is the only one that matters. So now the good shepherd comes on the scene. We've said that the door is closed to the self-righteous, but it's open to those who sue for mercy, who plead for mercy. We become part of God's family. Jesus leads us out. We go in and out. To go in and out is, is describing relationship. You rest in God. You work in God. You ride down the road in God. 
you play in God. You are never out for he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. To dwell, that word dwell doesn't mean to sit still. It means as you go. To sojourn is actually the word. And to sojourn is to travel. It's to be about your business. Jesus says when you go in and out, you find provision. You're always under his protection and his care. All right. So now. Verse 11. And by the way, this is number four. I am the good shepherd. The fourth I am statement. Jesus says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. That's how Jesus describes the good shepherd. The good shepherd stands between the sheep and the predators. Now, who is Jesus standing between? The thieves, those who he, he has proclaimed to be thieves and robbers, and the multitude of Israel. He is standing between the predators and the prey. And he says the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Willing to lay down his life. I think probably the most striking thing about Jesus laying down his life is his foreknowledge that he would lay down his life. This is 12 chapters or so before the cross. In, in the book of John. And lo and behold, Jesus is prophesying his own death. He says, not only am I going to lay down my life, I willingly lay down my life. I do it of my own initiative. Sounds like his daddy, doesn't he? God takes his own initiative to do what he's done for us. We have a very small part, if any, to play in that. God did it. It came to his mind. He decided it. He accomplished it. Amazing, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely amazing. Jesus says, I'm doing this of my own initiative because my Father commanded it and I have decided to obey Him. A choice. He's showing us a choice was made. He decided to obey. He made a choice to obey the Father and lay down His life. And because He did, Jesus says, The Father gave me the power to take it up again. Kill me many times you want to, I won't be dead. The good shepherd has taken up his life again. This is post-resurrection. And with it destroyed the power of the wolf. That's the other name Jesus gives to the Pharisees. The wolves. The robbers, the thieves, and the wolves. I don't have time to get into it, but they describe different ways that religious people operate among the saints. Maybe we'll have a chest talk about that. Mm. But you are under the care of your good shepherd. Mm. His spirit stands between you and their destructive devices. Because he's laid down his life. Mm. And he did so not only for Israel, but for all humanity. That's verses 10, verse 10, 16, when he says, Sheep of another fold I have, and I must bring them also. In other words, I must call them. They'll hear my voice. Have you ever noticed we don't, my wife and I, we don't have children. But I've been fortunate from time to time, blessed to hold babies in my arms. And the innocence that's there, it's palpable. But when the baby leaves my arms and goes to the arms of its mother, even with its eyes closed, very often you'll see a little smile. And as the mother begins to speak to the baby, that smile gets bigger. Now that baby doesn't know if he's English, if he's French, if he's Taiwanese, but he knows the sound of his mother's voice. He doesn't know what she's saying, but he or she 
but somehow there's a spiritual thing going on here is what I'm saying to you there's a transference of delight think about babies for a minute because if you think about them then you're going to think about yourself and God's family in a minute babies don't do a whole lot to add to the delightful atmosphere of a family they eat a lot they cry a lot they poop a lot mm -hmm. and yet mama or daddy picks up that baby and delights in them see the picture I'm wondering if we add a lot to God's existence we eat a lot we cry a lot we poop a lot but he delights in us. Don't you want the Holy Spirit to remind you that the Father delights in you? Mm -hmm. All that stuff that ain't right, all that stuff that ain't happening like it ought to, all that stuff, the concerns of our lives are like poop in the diaper. Mm -hmm. Aren't you glad God's good at changing diapers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, he delights in us. We, my point in all of this is he delights in us. If we delight, Jesus said, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to us? See, the, the Father's nature is our nature on steroids, are the good parts of our nature. On steroids is what I'm trying to say to you. If a parent delighted in you, God delights in you a million times over. I'm trying to say to you. You need to, I want you to remember tonight that you were delighted in. You're birthed into his family by his own initiative, and he delights in you. Now, the Good Shepherd, verse 20, I'm jumping from 16 to 28. Somebody read verse 28. Jesus then said, <clears throat> Yes, Jesus is mad. What are you doing? Oh, John 10. John 10. What? Yeah, that's what I mean. 28? 28. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. There you go. Shall anyone snatch them out of my hand? There you go. The good, good shepherd, I'm oh, sorry. The good, the good shepherd not only lays down his life for us, but he delights to give us life. And the life that he gives us, James, James, Peter picks up on this in 1 Peter, the first chapter. He says that we are born, he's talking about our regeneration. He says we're born of an imperishable seed. What's the difference between a perishable seed and an imperishable seed? One dies and rots, right? The other, you can't get rid of it, all right? It's like Virginia creeper. <laughs> it's, it's, like, <laughs> it's like kudzu, there you go. It's like kudzu. It's eternal. There should be a great satisfaction and a sense of security in knowing that Jesus has birthed you with imperishable seed so verse 28 which we just read Jesus gift the good shepherd's gift if you will is eternal somebody read John the next chap the next verse John 10 30. Thirty. Yes. I and my father are one. <laughs> See, I'm telling you, when there are certain religions that knock on doors, and they believe that Jesus is the a, a son of God, but they are not of the same essence. 
Jesus says, remember this verse, he's being clear. I and the Father are one. In case y'all missed it up there where I said I'm the door and I'm the good shepherd and I'm the bread of life and I am the light of the world. In case y'all missed it, I'm just going to tell you. The Father and I are one. This is when they were going to take up stones and take him off. All right. Because he, he's openly, unashamedly, boldly proclaiming that he and the Father are <coughs> One. Now, if you have time this week, look at Luke 15, 4 through 6. It's another picture of the good shepherd. What I've found is that if you meditate, I guess people are just different personalities, but my wife and I, when we're up in the morning, uh, she's usually up about 30 minutes before I am because she's a better Christian than I am. And uh, she's, in, she's in her chair, and she's got this devotional ditty here, and she's got her notepad here, and she's got her iPad here, and she's, and, and she's over there just going through these things so methodically. I got a Bible, a pencil, and a piece of paper, and it's usually the back of an envelope. If you ever want me to remember anything you've ever said to me, make sure it's past 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay. This scene I just described is like 5 o'clock in the morning. You could call me and tell me you were in a dire emergency. You better make sure I leave the house if you need me before hanging up. Because I will have forgotten all about it in just a minute. What I'm saying to you, people are different. And what I've found is very helpful for me in the morning. I'm a slow starter. All right. So what I have found is to take a verse and meditate on it. Oh, I can read the devotional. And I can make all kind of notes. And in the day, I wonder, what was I thinking? Where, where did that come from? Did it make any sense? Are there two sentences that connect to each other? You know, I, I, that's just the way I work. But what I found is when you meditate on a scripture or on a passage, the Holy Spirit will bring it back to you. That's what I'm saying. The scriptures I quote from time to time are not because I've memorized scripture. I'm a horrible memorizer. It's simple meditation. It's simple thinking about that. So I encourage you to meditate on the word so the Holy Spirit can will bring these things to our minds. All right. So the good shepherd. Meditate on that this week. The good shepherd shepherd. So Jesus is the exclusive door and he is the good shepherd. Jesus confronted everything and everybody that would rob you of life. He's already done it. You're under his care as a child. A child who's greatly delighted in a child who is greatly loved. This is why Paul would say in Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, he has made you to be accepted. That word accepted means highly favored. He's made you high like that little baby in a mother's arm. You are highly favored. And by the way, I hope you, you're getting this. God didn't save you in view of your potential. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't say no. See? The church says God saved you so you get to work for it. No, 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 no. God didn't save you in regard to your potential. God saved you because he loves you. 
His love brings potential to you. But see, if you think God saved you because of your potential, and then you don't reach your potential, where are you? I'm a disappointment to God. Like God who knows all things? Didn't know that I'd be a disappointment? <laughs> Come on, folks. God's not petty. He loves us. He loves it when we get things right. But he loves us, period. And he saved us because he loved us. <clears throat> Nothing to do with our potential in him. But loving us, he gives us amazing potential in him. The I door, like, go ahead. I like when you say he's not petty when he doesn't play games. No, he's not petty. I, and some of you could, uh, there are certain curse words we grew up hearing. And some of them were so bad I've even heard people call them the unpardonable sin. And then I heard a man say, do you really think God is so petty that because you said something with your tongue, he will hold it against you forever? You see what I'm saying? Now, I'm not, obviously I'm not advocating for <laughs> speech, all right? Matter of fact, cursing, you know what cursing is? A contempt for society. That's really what it is. When we curse, we have contempt for the life we're living. And if you do, as you well know, if you do it long enough, it just becomes another way of expression. It just becomes a, a way you express yourself. It doesn't really mean much to you. It's just the way you talk. Alan Jackson would wash your mouth out with soap. Yeah. Did you all have Miss Alan? Yeah. No. We did. <laughs> we did. Sure. I believe it. I believe it. But yeah, it, words are important, but God is not petty, is what I'm trying to say. And uh, and that's a that's a great that's a great another great snapshot of Jesus and who God is. He is he is not petty. He loves his children. Okay. Other comments? I really appreciate y'all being here. Because if you weren't, I'd be talking to myself. <laughs> it's a lot more fun than that. Talked with Diane Lowe today, and she said to give what Fuller and John to give everyone their love. They are very happy to have sold their house here. Mm -hmm. 